We recruit team members for our Mavericks Club members. If you are in Mavericks Club and you need a team member, this happened yesterday. I was on a call with one of our Mavericks who said we need to hire a new team member. This is the role. And I walked them through, I helped them understand the job scorecard. Their job now is to go away and finish the job scorecard and write the job ad, which I'll talk about in a moment. I'll talk about how the job ad and the job scorecard work together. Then they give that job ad to us. We review it. We make sure it's all good. And then our team go and place that job ad and actually recruit candidates, pre-vet them, and then hand over the top three candidates to our Mavericks Club member for them to interview and eventually make a decision and hopefully hire someone. If you're not in Mavericks Club, uh, the good news is you can still get access to the entire process that we go through to find, recruit, hire, and manage and onboard A players so that you can build your team and make sure you've got the right people in the right seat doing the right thing at the right time. <laughs> Gentlemen, <clears throat> welcome, welcome, welcome to another very special episode of the Agency Hour, live here in the Digital Mavericks Facebook group, of course. If you are listening to this as a podcast, you might be listening to Dave Stryker in the background there, a song called Things Ain't What They Used To Be. Uh, get on over to the Digital Mavericks Facebook group. If, as I said, if you're listening to this as a podcast, you should really come and join in the fun in the Digital Mavericks Facebook group because this podcast is a live stream into the group. That's right. We go live. We have cameras. I'm looking at the camera right now. I'm looking a little bit tired. Had a late night last night and Oscar came in early this morning, jumped into bed and started kicking us around about four o'clock and kept me and Amy awake for a few hours. So we're a little bit uh, a little bit tired this morning. I'm trying to dose up on cafe. Anyway, come and check us out in the group. Tonight on The Boring Show, Troy's going to tell you how tired he is. Come and check us out in the group. Just go to facebook.com and search for Digital Mavericks. And today, of course, it is part three of our week-long training to help you hire your first or next team member. A couple of days ago. Now, by the way, we've had a lot of questions about these live streams. People saying, are you going to post a replay somewhere? Well, the miraculous thing is that Mark Zuckerberg, who is obviously the boss man at Facebook, has hired people just for this purpose. I rang him up and I said, Mark, I'm going to go live in your, your thing called Facebook in one of my... I'll make that happen. So he employed some robots to do that very thing. So the recordings of these live streams, yes, they are in the guide section of the Digital Mavericks Facebook group. You just come into the group, you click on the guides tab, and then you can watch the replays. And they will be there forever because we want you to learn what you need to learn in order to hire your first or next team member so that you can get your life back and that you can grow a profitable agency and not sink in the process, right? Because that would not be good. We don't want you to burn out and we don't want you to go broke. We fix agencies here at Agency Mavericks. That's what we do. And part of that is helping you with your team. And so a couple of days ago, we had a live stream where we spoke about why you should hire your first or next team member and the impact that that would have on the business and your life as an agency owner. That was a very fun live stream. A lot of people uh, engaging in the comments and telling us how they feel about certain parts of their life on a scale of one to five and the work that they want to do around their family, their friend relationships, their fitness, their faith and fulfillment, their finances and the amount of fun they're having in their life. And that was a very interesting conversation. And then yesterday, we worked through the forward-facing org chart. And I walked you through Pete Perry's documentation on how to design an org chart for your agency 12 months down the track or three years down the track so that you can start to think about who, which roles you need to hire for. Today, we're going to do a deep dive into a document called the Job Scorecard, which is Super important and in fact now we don't hire anyone unless they have a job scorecard and we have all of our existing team members working towards a job scorecard. So performance is reviewed against the job scorecard and new people are hired against a job scorecard. And I'm going to show you 
a job scorecard today and I'm going to walk you through how to design one for the next role that you're going to hire for. It's going to be super fun. If you are in the Digital Mavericks Facebook group, please leave a comment uh, under this live stream and tell us which country you're from just so I know that it's working and that people are actually watching and that the sound is working. Max has just pulled up a little bumper there that says, where in the world are you? Uh, so just let us know in the comments where you are. And if you're listening to this as a podcast, then come into the group and tell us where you are. Uh, we have subscribers and listeners to the podcast all over the planet. We'd love to know where you are. Rob Lilly is here from Toronto in Canada. Hey, Rob, how are you doing? Thanks for joining in. <clears throat> uh, before we dive into the mechanics of a job scorecard, and how it works. I want to say hi to Belinda Lindhart from Sydney, Australia. And Facebook user is here from Christchurch in New Zealand. Hello, Facebook user. Uh, Zach Stepek is here from Illinois in the US. Hey, Zach, how you doing, brother? Uh, before I dive into the job scorecard, I just want to talk a little bit about belief for a minute. I just want to talk a little bit about your beliefs and how your beliefs will manifest what happens in your life. I woke up, as I said, Oscar came in about four o'clock this morning, started kicking us around and, you know, interfering with our sleep. And so I was laying awake last night, you know, and your brain does funny things in the middle of the night. My brother taught me this recently. He said, I was saying, oh, I woke up in the middle of the night last night and I couldn't get back to sleep because I was thinking about this and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, I started to go down a dark rabbit hole. You ever wake up in the middle of the night and just have really morbid thoughts? And you go, what the hell is going on? And all of a sudden you're just like, thinking these really morbid, bleak thoughts and you can't get back to sleep because you're just laying there terrified about everything, right? And my brother said, oh, for God's sake, don't listen to your brain in the middle of the night. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, in the middle of the night, your subconscious is just filing everything away. And so if you wake up while that's happening, you, you, there's going to be all this random weird stuff going on in your brain like a scene out of a Tarantino film you shouldn't pay attention to any of it because none of it's real. It's just your mind trying to figure stuff out and trying to process things and file things away. And that's what dreams are. There's like when you have a dream, it's like your conscious mind trying to figure out what your subconscious mind's doing, right? And he said, so don't pay any attention to the thoughts that you have in the middle of the night. I'm like, oh, really? Wow. Oh, well, that's a relief, <laughs> right? Because if I did pay attention to the thoughts I was having in the middle of the night, I probably wouldn't get out of bed the next day because I would just lose all sense of optimism and faith and I'd probably just want to pull the quilt over my head and stay there forever and curl up into a ball and watch reruns of Law & Order SVU with Mariska Hargitay running around Manhattan catching the bad people because that's my happy place. So that let me off the hook and I was like, okay, great. I don't need to pay any attention to those thoughts anymore. I'm just going to ignore them and just realise that my brain is doing weird things. <clears throat> Where was I going with this? Oh, that's right. Last night, however, I had a moment where, I, where, I, where something clicked into place for me. My subconscious was doing some filing and I realised that something got filed in the right spot. I'm like, oh, right, of course. Now, a couple of, I'll tell you what it is. <clears throat> a couple of days ago, somebody shared, one of our mavericks sh uh, pinged me in Slack, Simon Major pinged me in Slack, who's one of our legendary most successful Mavericks Club members he's just an absolute ripper bloke as we say here in Australia ripper bloke Simon Major from Practice Edge in Diamond Creek here in Melbourne he sent me an Instagram a link to an Instagram story now I don't use Instagram I recently deleted my Instagram account right I, I recently looked at it and went I don't even know what this is why is it on my phone I never use it I'm out gone and I deleted my Instagram account but he sent me a link to an Instagram. Now, we still have a business Instagram account, but I just deleted my own Instagram account because I don't use it. I use Pinterest more than Instagram, but that's a whole other story. He sent me a link to this Instagram reel, and it was uh, Steve Harvey. Is that his name, Steve Harvey? Who um, I should know what Steve Harvey does, and unfo unfortunately, <clears throat> excuse me, unfortunately I don't know what Steve Harvey does, but I think he's like a wealth guy. Um, I'm just going to Google him right now to try and find out what he does. Steve Harvey is an American television host, actor, writer, producer, and comedian. There you go. He hosts the Steve Harvey morning show, Family Feud, Celebrity Family Feud, the Miss Universe competition, Family Feud Africa, and arbitration-based court comedy, Judge Steve Harvey. There we go. Fantastic. He's 65 years old, 
born in West Virginia, United States, and currently stands 1.85 metres high. There you go. Now, he... That's direct from Wikipedia, ladies and gentlemen. He... Uh, and pardon my ignorance, I don't live in America, so I, I, I kind of knew he was a celebrity, but I didn't know why. But there, there you go, he's a host. Uh, he posted this Instagram story, and he said, <clears throat> "You, when you fly first class or business class the first time, it's and I know this because when I flew business class the first time, I took selfie photos and sent them to my mum and my wife and my mother-in-law and my brother, just kind of going, holy shit, how did this happen? I'm in business class and I'm drinking champagne and it's 10 o'clock in the morning. Shit's going to get real. And this, I mean, the seat is a bed, right? It, it's, if, you've never phoned, if you've never flown business class, you, don't know, you can't understand what I'm talking about. And if you have, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you have, there is no going back. And this was the point of Steve's Instagram reel is once you've flown business class and you see and you experience what that's like, it's really hard to get on a plane the next time. And in Australia, when you get on a plane, you turn left into business class or you turn right into economy class. And I've flown business class and I hate turning right and going into economy now. It, it, I, it, it, makes, me, it makes every part of my body ache when I get on a plane and turn right and have to go into economy class because I'm missing out on business class. Right? Now, I haven't flown internationally for a long time. Domestically, it doesn't really matter because I'm on a plane for about an hour. I still like to fly business class if I can. But internationally, long haul, I do not like flying economy long haul because by the time I get to LA from Melbourne, I'm cooked. 14 hours cooped up in a seat. Max knows what, he's, what I'm talking about because the last time we flew, he was in economy and I was in business class. Sorry, dude. Uh, I had the points, sorry. Uh, and once you've flown business class, what happens is your mind and your subconscious do whatever it takes to make sure that you don't have to turn right and go into economy next time, right? And the point of his Instagram reel was if you step into that space and you start living the way that you want to live, your subconscious will work really hard to make sure you don't go back. I'm not suggesting that you make irresponsible financial decisions, by the way. I just need to put in a great big fat disclaimer right here. I am not a financial advisor. Please do not take any financial advice from me whatsoever. What I will share with you is this. Every time I've made a decision that has stretched me financially, my subconscious has found a way to make that the new standard, the new minimum standard that I am now responsible for. I'm not going back. I bought a Tesla Model 3 about uh, nine months ago. I don't pay for petrol anymore. And the car was like, I don't know, 50, $62,000 plus on roads. I think it ended up being about 68 or 69 grand drive away, right? You've got $3,000 back from the Victorian government here for driving an electric vehicle. I'm effect now they've come down in price since, but I'm effectively driving a sixty-two thousand dollar motor vehicle. That's it's like holy shit, that's a lot of money, right? Tomorrow I pick up a brand new Kia Sorento plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, eighty-two thousand dollar motor car. Right, I pick it up tomorrow. Um, there's no going back. And it's not about the money, by the way. It's about the fact that they don't use petrol. Now, the Sorento uses a little bit of petrol if you drive on long roads, but if you just on long drives, if you're just driving around town, you put it in full electric mode, you get about 70 kilometres out of it in full electric mode. So for me, that's why I'm getting the car because I don't want to use petrol. The point I'm trying to make is that once you make that decision and you step into that space, your subconscious gets a very big signal from your actions and your behavior that, oh, okay, this is what we do now. And your subconscious goes into overdrive to make sure you don't go backwards. So last night, <clears throat> I'm, I, I promise I'm going somewhere with this. Last night, I'm laying there in the middle of the night and I realize if you don't believe that your agency is going to get to half a million dollars in revenue, then it never will. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how hard you work. It doesn't matter how many ads you run. It doesn't matter how many lead magnets you produce. It doesn't matter how many phone calls you make. It doesn't matter how many B&I breakfasts you go to. It doesn't matter how many word camps you go to to network. None of that matters. 
if you believe that your agency will never get to $500,000 a year in revenue, then it won't. It can't. It's impossible. Because you cannot live inconsistently with your beliefs. You just can't do it. And the example I always use for this is a bit crass. But the, the, the example is walk into a busy intersection in the middle of town and in the middle of the day and stand there and wet your pants. Imagine standing in the middle of a busy intersection in the middle of town in the middle of the day and just wetting your pants. Right? Deliberately. How hard would you have to work? How many psychological barriers would you have to overcome to do that? Why? Because we believe that that behaviour is not socially acceptable and we are a pack animal and we want to be accepted by our tribe and we want to know that we fit in and that we belong and that we're loved. And doing that would probably make everyone laugh at us or walk in the opposite direction and then we would feel alone, we would feel ostracised, we would feel like we don't belong and we wouldn't feel loved. So we believe that that behaviour is going to be detrimental to our own well-being, so therefore we don't do it. It would be very, very difficult to do that. Very difficult. So the point I'm trying to make is if you be whatever you believe is true. Right? If you believe you can, then you are right. If you believe you can't, then you are right. So if you believe that you do not have the capability or the resilience or the resourcefulness to hire team members and grow your agency to the point where it can almost run without you, or maybe you just want to work three days a week instead of six, or maybe you want to spend more time with your young family and you don't want to work weekends doing care plan updates like Carl in New Zealand when he joined Mavericks Club. That was his thing. He's like, dude, I'm working until 11 o'clock every night and most Saturdays and we're about to have a baby. Well, they had the baby a couple of weeks ago. Had a little girl called Lily. And he's not working weekends or weeknights anymore. He's got more team members doing stuff. If you don't believe that you have what it takes to do that, then you are right. So we can teach you everything about org charts and job scorecards and managing a team and all that kind of stuff. And unfortunately, none of that is going to be helpful unless you believe, truly, truly believe that you have what it takes to grow your agency, grow a team and get some of your life back. Right? It's not easy. Anyone who tells you that... Growing, anyone who tells you that being a business owner is easy is lying to you and probably has some kind of agenda and they probably want to sell you their course or their weekend retreat or their mastermind or some bloody thing, right? That you can make money fall out of the sky even if you have no brains and you can't talk and you have no arms. It doesn't matter. You can do it, right? You've all, we've all seen that messaging. Well, it's rubbish, <clears throat> It's hard work and it's not easy. It doesn't mean you have to work 18 hours a day, like some people would believe, that you have to just hustle, hustle, hustle 18 hours a day until your eyes bleed. That's also crap. You don't need to do that. It's not easy. It is hard work and things are going to go wrong all the time. But if you believe that you can do it, then you are 90% of the way there. And when I say believe, I don't just mean you say to yourself, you know, I'm going to hire a developer and everything will be okay. You need to actually put yourself, you need to imagine yourself in the future on a Zoom call with your developer, celebrating that you've just launched this new project and your developer did a great job and your developer is wherever they live in the world, doesn't matter, could be down the street, could be in the same office as you, could be in Venezuela. We had one of our Mavericks on a call yesterday. Uh, actually, he didn't turn up. His project manager turned up from Venezuela and she introduced herself and said, oh, g'day, welcome. Nice to meet you. She's been working with this Maverick for about three months. She said he's awesome. She loves working with him. Could be You could have a development team in Vietnam, like one of our Mavericks members. She has an office and a whole team in Vietnam. You could have staff in the Philippines. You could have staff in Tasmania. It doesn't matter. I want you to future 
pace yourself and imagine that it's three months from now and you are on Zoom celebrating with your team and your newest team member, whether that's one or whether your team is four or 17 and you are celebrating the launch of a new project and you are proud that you have built a team and that you lead this team through the journey that you are going on. And I want you to imagine what that feels like Close your eyes and imagine what that feels like and emotionally, what does it feel like and what what are the physical sensations that you get? Do you get goosebumps when you hear stories from your team about the success that your clients are having? Do you get tingles knowing that you are providing a great workplace for your team to develop and evolve as individuals? I want you to imagine what that feels like. And if you can imagine what that feels like and you can really put yourself in the future and believe that yes, Belinda Lindhart is leading a team. I'm just picking on one of our viewers here. Belinda, I hope you don't mind. She's in Sydney, Australia. Belinda Lindhart is growing and leading a team that is doing great work for our clients. If you can believe that and embody it and know what it feels like, you are 90% of the way there to achieving it. If you can't believe it, If there is a voice in the back of your head that says, that's never going to happen because you grew up on the wrong side of the tracks and went to a crappy school and didn't get enough love from mum and dad when you were a kid. If you believe that story, then it's never going to happen. doesn't matter how much we help you. doesn't matter how many frameworks we give you. We could hire people for you. It's not going to work. They'll leave or you'll fire them. Right? You will sabotage it if you don't believe it because you can't have something that you don't believe you deserve or you can't have something that you don't believe that you are capable of. You just can't. It's impossible, right? <clears throat> Thanks, Belinda. She gave me a smiley face in the comments. Thanks for letting me use you as a guinea pig. I hope you don't mind. All right, so having said all of that, ladies and gentlemen, hey, by the way, just let me know in the comments because, you know, words of affirmation are my love language, right? I need to hear it. I need to hear and see the words. Come on, bring it on home to Uncle Troy. Let me know in the comments what's been most valuable about this conversation so far. We've been here for 20 minutes now, 21 minutes and 40 seconds. What's been most valuable? And if you're listening to this as a podcast, right, write it down, open your notes app on your iPhone or that other thing if you don't use iPhones, that other, apparently other companies make phones too. I don't know what they are, but if you're using something that's not an iPhone, open your note-taking app. Right? And write down what's been most valuable about this conversation so far. And then when you're in front of your computer or if you've got Facebook on the phone, join the group and let me know, please. I want to know whether any of this is resonating with you. Because if it's not, then I need to go find other people to talk to. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, so let me know what's resonating with you. What's been most valuable about this conversation so far? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to open my screen in a minute and I'm going to share my my job scorecard playbook. This is a playbook straight out of Mavericks Club, which is our $25,000 a year mastermind program. And this is a playbook straight out of Mavericks Club. It is our recruitment system that we give all of our Mavericks. We actually recruit, so just a bit of context, for those of you who, who, who missed this earlier on in the week, we recruit team members for our Mavericks Club members. If you are in Mavericks Club and you need a team member, This happened yesterday. I was on a call with one of our Mavericks who said we need to hire a new team member. This is the role. And I walked them through, I helped them understand the job scorecard. Their job now is to go away and finish the job scorecard and write the job ad, which I'll talk about in a moment. I'll talk about how the job ad and the job scorecard work together. Then they give that job ad to us. We review it. We make sure it's all good. And then our team go and place that job ad and actually recruit candidates, pre-vet them, and then hand over the top three candidates to our Mavericks Club member for them to interview and eventually make a decision and hopefully hire someone. If you're not in Mavericks Club, uh, the good news is you can still get access to the entire process that we go through to find, recruit, hire, and manage and onboard A players so that you can build your team and make sure you've got the right people in the right seat doing the right thing at the right time. And more details on that tomorrow because tomorrow I'm going to walk you through the entire Team Accelerator blueprint. I'm going to walk you through all the different components of it. 
And then we are going to open the doors to our brand new training called the Team Accelerator Blueprint, which where we will help you and walk you through every step of the way and hold your hand, a step-by-step process to make sure that you have everything you need to hire your first or next team member. Uh, question here, overseas or local Aussie staff. We recruit from our talent pool in the Philippines at the moment. We may expand that in the future. Uh, there's a great talent pool in South America. There's a great talent pool in Eastern Europe. There's a great talent pool in South Africa. Uh, we don't recruit here in Australia, partially because the regulations and the legalities are just a minefield. However, you can use our process to recruit staff anywhere. The process works regardless of where you're recruiting. If you want us to recruit for you, then one, you have to be in Mavericks Club. Two, those candidates will come from our talent pool in the Philippines. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to attempt here to share some slides. Now, what happens when I push that button? Look at that, Max, it works. Wow. So what, I, what we've learned in StreamYard is that you can just upload a PDF directly into StreamYard and just share the slides directly here. Don't even need to uh, share my screen. It's amazing. Fantastic. So I'm going to skip through some of these slides. I'm not going to walk you through the entire playbook because this is, as I said, proprietary playbook for our Mavericks Club members. But I'm just going to show you a few pages from this playbook. We talked about the org chart builder uh, over the last couple of days. And that's the first few pages here that is in the uh, the the org chart, there's a, there's, a, there's a sneak peek of the entire process, which we're gonna talk more about tomorrow. Uh, yesterday, we talked about the org chart builder and we walked you through how to build your future facing org chart. Today, we're going to walk through the job scorecard. Now the job score, let me show you, let me tell you where this fits in. Once you've done your, your org chart, you should know which role you're going to hire next. At that point, what you need to do is develop a job scorecard. Now this is inspired very, very largely by the work that Jeff Smart uh, and his dad, Brad Smart, have done with top grading. I won't bore you with the details, but I will say this. If you really want to understand this, there's a fantastic book by Jeff Smart called WHO, W-H-O, WHO, not World Health Organization, WHO, W-H-O. That's It's just called WHO, okay, by Jeff Smart, G-E-O-F-F. And you should definitely read that book. It is a game changer. And at the center of that book, at the core of that book, is the difference between a job description and a job scorecard. Typically what happens is, it, and if you go to LinkedIn or if you go to Indeed or if you go to Seek or if you go to any of the job boards, wherever you are around the world, you will see all of the ads for, uh, for roles being advertised and all the ads look the same. And it is a description of the tasks that you are going to perform in this role. Hmm? We are looking for a project manager and you will have three years of experience project managing and you will know all the project management best practices and blah, 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 blah. And they are boring. All of the, I read all of the job ads. I go, there is no, absolutely no reason for me to reach out and connect with you people at all because you sound boring. And you're basically telling me that here is a list of tasks that you want me to perform and that you are going to micromanage me into the ground. And if I don't do exactly what you tell me to, then you'll fire me. Right? I have a better idea. And this, a lot of this comes from Jeff's work in Who. Instead of describing, and what I've learned over the years, and, and not only from my own mistakes, of which there have been many, but also coaching lots of agency owners who hire a project manager and then try and teach them how to be a project manager. And my response to that has always been, hang on a second, we are working on the assumption that you, the agency owner, are a good project manager. And in fact, you're a better project manager than the project manager you've just hired. Why don't you just hire a project manager who knows what they're doing and then let them do their job? And they could teach you how to project manage, right? And I think a lot of the time what happens is we think we're unicorns and we think we're the best at it. So we hire people and then teach them how we do it. When how we do it isn't very good. Because if it was, we wouldn't be hiring someone, right? 
We're not a community college, ladies and gentlemen. We're not here to hire 17 year olds and teach them how to be grown ups and how to do the job. I mean, you can do that if you want, but it's a different business model. If you're an agency, you want to hire people who know what they're doing. And yes, they will need some induction and they will need some onboarding to understand how you do the things that you do in your agency. But you hire people who know what they're doing and then just let them do their job. Get out of their way, give them everything they need to succeed. And as you'll see here in the job scorecard, ultimately make them responsible for outcomes, not ticking off a list of tasks, okay? <clears throat> I'll tell you what, Max, <clears throat> I think I'm going to tell them a story, Max. You know what that means? <laughs> That's right. It's story time with Uncle Troy. Um, when we go camping, let me give you an example of an outcome. When we go camping with the other families that all have kids a similar age, right? We go camping, there's probably about six or seven families that go camping semi-regularly when we can all get our schedules lined up. And we've all got kids that range from, you know, newborns up to seven-year-olds. And it's chaos, right? It's fun, but it's chaos. You come home and you need a holiday from camping because no one slept, right? Um, the outcome is this. The campsite's about four hours out of town. We're going to be driving through peak hour traffic to get there. And pitching a tent in the dark is no fun. And we generally camp on unpowered sites where there's no electricity. And so if you get there after the sun's gone down, you're pitching a tent in the dark. And that is just horrible. Not fun at all. So here's the outcome, ladies and gentlemen. We want to have the campsite set up before the sun goes down. Right? That's it. That's the outcome. Now, people have questions. Typically, when you say that, people have questions. Well, what time does the sun go down? Well, that's a very good question. That's a great question to ask. The sun goes down at about 6 p.m. that time of year. Okay. So the next question is, how long does it take to set the campsite up once we get there? Well, that's also an excellent question. See, we're working backwards now. It's called reverse engineering. Well, I reckon we need two hours to really set up the campsite properly so that we can be just super chilled out, having some dinner, maybe sipping a glass of red wine or Pinot. We get the kids ready for bed and uh, it's 5.45 and everyone's chilled out and there's a little bit of light still and the sun's going down. Maybe we could walk down the beach and watch the sun set. That would be nice, wouldn't it? So I reckon we're going to need uh, about two hours. So what you're saying is that we need to be at the campsite by 4 p.m., the absolute latest. Yes, that's right. Excellent. And what day of the week are we going camping? Friday. Okay. Well, typically speaking, Friday afternoons are really busy with traffic getting out of the city. That's right. And how far is the campsite? Well, it's a four-hour drive. If we got in the car and didn't stop, it's a four-hour drive. And if there was no one on the road, it's a four-hour drive. It's 400 kilometres. We do 100 kilometres an hour, it's a four-hour drive. We need to be there by four o'clock, yes. And we've got two kids, that's right. And they won't sit in the car for four hours without a break. No, they won't. So what time do you think we should leave? Well, that's a very good question. I think we should leave at about 9 a.m. to give ourselves plenty of time to get there. And if we find we're ahead of schedule, we might even be able to duck into a local brewery on the way and have a bit of lunch. If we're running behind schedule and traffic's heavy, we're just going to have to grab a pie from a milk bar on the way and eat in the car. How we get there doesn't really matter. What matters is we get there and the campsite is set up before the sun goes down. Because if I'm pitching a tent in the dark, I'm going to be grumpy. Right? So that's an outcome, ladies and gentlemen. Right? How we get there and the series of tasks that we need to tick off along the way might change. But the outcome is the outcome. Okay, so that's an example of an outcome. So let me bring up my slides again. And let me start to walk you through the job scorecard. Again, go read the book Who by Jeff Smart. Thank you, Blinda. Blinda found that story funny. The job scorecard consists simply of three sections. Job descriptions are used to hire new team members and set expectations. The problem with job descriptions is that they are based on an assumption that we know how to do the job already and they stifle any creativity from the new hire 
to find a new path forward. So a new team member might come in and say, hey, why do we do things like that? And you go, I don't know, because I don't know what I'm doing. And I kind of hacked it together three years ago and we've done it that way ever since. Whereas a job scorecard frees up the new team member to go, you know what, there's a better way to do this. And me as an agency owner these days, as a business owner now, I go, great, find a better way and tell me. I'm just, I'm not involved. You don't need my permission, dude, just go do it. So job scorecards describe the outcome a role is responsible for, not the tasks they need to complete. And again, go check out the work of Brad Smart and Jeff Smart in Top Grading and the book Who, because that's where this comes from. So a job scorecard consists of three sections, the purpose of the role or why this role exists, the outcomes the role is responsible for delivering, and the competencies the role needs to have in order to succeed within the organization. And that might be technical proficiencies. If you're a WordPress agency, they obviously need to know WordPress if they're gonna be a developer. Right. Uh, if you are a Google Drive um, shop, they need to know how to use the Google products. If you're an Adobe shop, they need to know how to use the Adobe products. Right. If they are uh, in marketing, they probably need to understand direct response copywriting and conversion rate optimization. OK, they might need public speaking skills. They might need to know Figma or be able to learn it very quickly. So they're the, they're the competencies that they need to be successful in the role. So let's dive in and actually unpack some of this. So what we've given you, and I believe that you should all have this, I believe that we've actually emailed this to you, the job scorecard. I don't know whether we've emailed you the whole thing or whether we've just emailed you the job scorecard section, uh, but you should have this on email, right? This is, what we've done here is we've given you some worksheets and we've given you some examples. So here's an example for an agency called Local Web. And the company mission for this web agency is to help local small business owners use the power of the internet to make a bigger difference for their clients, their communities, and their loved ones. Fantastic. And they have their company values, accountability, communication, integrity, always improving, and leadership. All right, we have emailed you. I've, I've just had confirmation here from the team. We have emailed you the job scorecard section of this playbook. Very good. I'm glad we didn't email you the whole thing. It would have been confusing. Uh, so the job scorecard you will have on your email. Now, the role that the local web agency is hiring for is a developer. And the mission of the role is to build WordPress websites that are stunning in appearance, comply with industry standards, and ultimately help our clients reach their clients. Okay? The values that we need in this role, and this is just a worksheet where you brainstorm some ideas. And again, if you're listening to this as a podcast, please come and join the Digital Mavericks Facebook group so you can see me walk you through this on the screen. It's really important. And you will have this on email if you're on our email list. If you're not on our email list, you should email support at agencymavericks.com and request a copy of the Job Scorecard Playbook, as mentioned by Troy on the podcast. The values that we need in this role is to meet deadlines and show up to meetings. Communication solves 99.9% .9 of any problem, so stay in regular communication. Do what you say you're going to do. Uh, we can always improve and optimize everything and think and solve problems rather than asking for solutions. Be proactive. Okay, so they're the, that's the kind of behavior that we expect in alignment with the company values. The next part of this. Uh, so then we have a blank sheet where you can fill that in for the role that you're going to hire, right? So look at the, your org chart from yesterday and go, yes, I'm going to hire a project manager and then start filling this in. The next section on the job scorecard is the outcomes. And I love this. This is my wheelhouse, ladies and gentlemen. One of my superpowers is figuring out outcomes for roles. So what we do is we have an outcome and then we have what's called a KPI. How are we going to measure that outcome? And I want to talk about this for a second because I think it's really important. Measuring KPIs is not an opportunity for you to wrist slap your employees because they're not doing their job. Measuring KPIs is an opportunity for your team members to come to meetings, beating their chest, pointing to the scoreboard going, look at what I did. I'm doing amazing work and I'm making a meaningful contribution to the team and I know that because of that number. Okay, that's the purpose of a KPI. More carrot, less stick, ladies and gentlemen. So the outcome here for 
this developer. Here are the outcomes that local web agency has decided that the developer should be responsible for. And remember, outcomes need to be very specific and you need to be able to communicate them in just a few words and they need to be very clear, basic English sentences, right? Nothing too confusing. Your new team member should understand exactly what they're responsible for when you explain it to them. If they're like, oh, I don't understand what that means, then you need to do some work on the outcome. So here are some examples for a developer. Client feedback is positive and clients are happy. If you see that in your business, you go, wow, the feedback we're getting on our websites since Jim started building them is amazing. And all our clients seem to be really happy. That's a great outcome, Jim. Well done. Keep, I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it. Now, how do we measure that? Well, the typical KPI, I'm not going to run through all of these, but I'll give you a couple of examples. The typical KPI is uh, what we call a CSAT, a customer satisfaction, right? So client feedback and positive, client feedback is positive and clients are happy. So what you would do is after every project that you launch, you would send your customer a very simple customer satisfaction survey. Hey, on a scale of one to 10, how satisfied are you with the work that we did on your recent website? And they say an eight. You go, great, everyone's happy. They say a five and you go, oh, maybe there's a problem. We should have a conversation about it. If they say two, you drop everything and call them immediately. Say, what happened? What went wrong? Jimmy, get over here. Let's get on the phone and sort this out because we have a problem. So Jimmy now knows every week he turns up and he says, look at this. Our CSAT is currently four and a half out of five. Over the last 90 days, it's gone up. It was three and a half when I started. It's now four and a half. I'm doing a good job. You go, well done, Jimmy. Have a biscuit. Congratulations. Right? Uh, the, the second, <laughs> have a biscuit. The second outcome is to remove, so here's the second outcome for developer role, is to remove the CEO from web builds and maintenance tasks. That's an outcome. I'm the CEO of the agency and I do not want to do maintenance tasks or get involved in web builds anymore. In three months' time, Jimmy, if you're still asking me which widget we should use in Elementor for that testimonials thing, then you don't get any biscuits. Get me out of this process, all right? And <laughs> how are we going to measure that? Well, the CEO is focused on business development by the 31st of December. In fact, I would go as far to say that the CEO needs to track her time and that she should be spending... 40% of her time doing business development by 31st of December and zero time doing web builds and maintenance tasks. That's how you measure the success of that outcome. And in fact, Jimmy should be nagging the CEO every week saying, Jane, are you still doing maintenance tasks? Are you still doing web builds? No, I want to know that I'm doing my job here, so I need to get you out of this process? What do I need to do to get you out of care plans? What do I need to do to get you out of this, right? So Jimmy should be owning that outcome. All right, the next outcome, the next example of an outcome here is to make a positive contribution to the team. And the way that you would measure that, first of all, you're going to know if they're not making a positive contribution because people are going to be whinging about them, right? Really common for staff to do a great job, but just be a little bit toxic for the team. And if you don't get rid of those people or correct their behavior, you'll lose other team members because they will just say, I don't want to work here anymore because Jimmy's an idiot. And how do you measure that? Well, you can run uh, a thing called an ESAT, which is an employee satisfaction survey. You can also call it a TSAT. Some of our Mavericks call it a TSAT, which is a team satisfaction survey. And again, every 90 days, you just ask your employees how they feel about their role in the team, how they feel about their team members, and how they feel about the company and is the company serving them? Is the company helping them develop and grow? Three questions. How do you feel about your role in the company? How do you feel about your team members? And how do you feel about the company in terms of how we're developing you and supporting you? Just keep your finger on the pulse, right? Just run that survey every 90 days so you can keep your finger on the pulse. And if someone's like, well, you know, I'm a four out of five in terms of my role and I think the company's great, but I'm a two out of five in terms of the rest of the team, then you pick up the phone and have a conversation. You go, Max, what's going on? Oh, Jimmy's a bloody idiot, mate. You've given him too many biscuits and he's not working anymore. You're slowing everyone down. 
All right, and final example here is timely support ticket updates and troubleshooting. Now, I would, I would even go as far as to say this. Timely support ticket updates and troubleshooting, I think, is a task, and I don't think you need that as an outcome. I'm a big fan, by the way, of having no more than three outcomes, partially because I can't concentrate on any more than three things at once, Right? Introduce a fourth thing and I'm down to one. I can't even remember what my name is or what day of the week it is or what I'm supposed to be doing. So I would suggest that if you are not handling support tickets in a timely fashion, that you can't achieve your first outcome, which is client feedback is positive and clients are happy. Client feedback will not be positive and clients will not be happy if you're taking two weeks to get back to a support ticket or to solve a problem or to troubleshoot something. Right? If a client's not getting emails from their contact form for seven days because you've dropped the ball, then they're not going to give you a four out of five on their CSAT. So I would suggest that that outcome could even be rolled up into the first outcome. Right? I'm always looking at the big domino that knocks over the little ones. Okay. So... I think outcome number one here solves outcome number three, four, right? Outcome number four in this example here, I think can actually be rolled up and included in outcome number one. What is the big domino that knocks over the little ones? Okay. So I, so I just always try and condense outcomes down to a maximum of three. So what is the outcome and then how are you going to measure it is the KPI, all right? I hope that's helpful. Yes. And, uh, now we give you a blank page in the playbook to write your own outcomes. And let me just say this. The first time that you write an outcome, it's not going to be right. It's going to be horrible. It's not going to be clear. It won't be concise. You won't know what you're doing. That's okay. Just give yourself permission to be crap at this for a while until you get it right. The more you do it, the easier it gets and the more it makes sense. So please do not try and get it right first. Come up with some outcomes for your developer and then, or your project manager and then do it again and then do it again and then do it again, okay? Think, think of it like this. Think of the camping trip. Like how will you know you have succeeded? Hey, look, man, we're having a glass of Pinot. The sun's going down. The campsite's done. The sun's going to go down. We'll go home, give the kids some food, put them in the bars, put them to bed. Then we can cook up, sit around and chat. Everyone's happy, the tents are done, the campsite's done, and it's still daylight. That's how we know we've succeeded, okay? Go to that level. How will I know this person is successful in this role? What will I see in the business? What will I experience? What will I hear from our clients? What will I hear from our team? Okay, the final part of this playbook is the competencies. And what we've done here is just given you some examples and then a blank sheet, okay? And again... Uh, the way to think about competencies is to first write out the responsibilities, right? What, what are the areas of responsibility? So in this case, they're going to be responsible for building WordPress websites using the provided design, content, and to follow industry best practices. They're going to proactively seek and suggest plugins and or code improvements to the end product. They're going to help develop procedures and testing schedules. They'll probably do things like manage your version control on Bitbucket or GitHub, They'll use Manage WP to keep all care plan client sites up to date. Or if you're in my world, we'd be using WP Remote because, by the way, I just think that's a better solution to Manage WP, but I don't want to get stuck in the weeds there. But there's a whole other conversation. We'll actually get the guys from WP Remote on for a call soon on the podcast. They're going to respond to and address all maintenance tasks. These are the things they're responsible for. So then in order to complete these responsibilities, they need to have these competencies, okay? They need people skills. You'll need to talk with the designer and be able to troubleshoot problems together. Attention to detail. You need to be a person who checks your work and tests for all situations. Okay. Uh, be a mobile first developer. Uh, you know, don't, don't ship something that doesn't work on, you know, one of the things that really drives me nuts is when you come up on the phone and you have to fill in a form and it's clearly a numeric field on the form and people who get it right, as soon as you activate that form, your keypad on the phone just turns into numbers and you go, yes. 
And the people who don't pay attention to that, you're trying to put in a phone number and it's still the standard keyboard on your phone and you have to flick over the numbers and it's like, oh, this is a bad experience because the developer didn't think to make that numeric field switch the keypad on the phone. Little details like that, right? Uh, so these are the kinds of competencies that we expect you to have in order to fulfill your responsibilities so that you can deliver your outcomes, which will be measured through these KPIs. And that's all tied into the purpose of the role. Why are you in the building? Why does your role exist? Why are you here? Okay. And there's also a space here to put the type of role. Is this a contractor, a full-time employee? Is it part-time? Uh, do you want an agency? Do you want a freelancer? Uh, and remuneration, what are you willing to pay? And if you don't know what you're willing to pay, by the way, you need to know your numbers. And I do believe in the workbook here that we've sent you, there's a link to a blog post and it might be even a free training video on a spreadsheet on our website, which is the financial spreadsheet for your agency. So figure out your numbers and make sure that you maintain your profit margins as you are hiring people. That's a whole other conversation for another day. Now I did, obviously now there's a blank page for you to fill in your uh, competencies there for your role. And at that point, ladies and gentlemen, you basically have your job scorecard done. You've got the purpose, you've got your outcomes, and you've got your competencies. Now I did talk before about how the job scorecard and the job ad interact and I did say that I would explain uh, how that works and here's how it works. The job ad you then write based on the job scorecard. Once you've done the job scorecard, the job ad writes itself. You basically, like my template for a job ad is, hey, this is who we are, this is the mission we're on, this is what we believe. If you believe this stuff too and you're really passionate about helping agencies grow, you should come talk to us. If you don't care about agencies and you don't understand the web agency model and you don't give a shit about it and it bores you to tears, please don't apply for a job here. All right? uh, here are the outcomes that you're going to be responsible for. Keeping all clients happy, getting positive feedback, you know, freeing up the CEO to work on biz dev. Right? And uh, these are the kind of competencies that we need you to have. We don't list out the tasks in the job description, in the job ad, okay? The job ad is a basically a shortened, brief version with a bit of sizzle about your agency and why people should come work with you and the impact that you're having in the world. You post that and then people start putting their hand up and applying and then you put them through what we call the 3C interview process, which is a whole conversation for another time. Right, hey, what's been most valuable about this? I feel like this has been an epic, epic episode of the Agency Hour. Uh, I've certainly had a lot of fun. I hope you guys have learned something. What's been most valuable about our conversation here? We've been on for 51, 52 minutes now. What's been most valuable over the last 52 minutes? Uh, what's been your biggest takeaway moment and your biggest aha? Remember, coming up tomorrow, I'm going to walk you through the entire mind map of the Team Accelerator Blueprint, which is essentially... All of It's a step-by-step -step process, all of the things that you need to have in place to make sure that you hire the right people at the right time, put them in the right seat and get them working on the right things, okay? And I'll give you a hint, the job scorecard is a big part of that. There's a whole other process wrapped around it in terms of finding the candidates, interviewing them, onboarding them, making sure they're a good fit. Uh, all of that stuff we're going to go through tomorrow. And then we're also going to give you details tomorrow on how you can get access to our Team Accelerator Blueprint training, uh, which opens tomorrow on this call, I believe. So join in for that because uh, it's going to be epic. Facebook user says outcomes to tasks. Outcomes instead of tasks has been the biggest uh, takeaway. Yes, what has been most valuable for you on this call? By the way, we do get a lot of questions about these live streams and if we are recording them. And as I said at the start, yes, we do record them and the replays will be in the guides section of the Digital Mavericks Facebook group and they will live there forever or for at least as long as the Digital Mavericks Facebook group exists, then these replays will live in the guides section. So you can always come back and re-watch these in the future and they are totally free for all of our group members. There is no charge to come and watch these trainings and. Uh, and learn some good stuff. And if you have any questions about this particular training or any of the trainings, just ask questions underneath the video in the Facebook group and someone will come in and answer those questions. Belinda Lindhart says, I think the greatest thing would be getting out of the person's way and letting them do their job without the stress 
because you have the foundation sorted. Yes, without the stress, because you have the foundation sorted. Yes, exactly. And outcomes are the key to that, Belinda. Rob Liddy says, thank you. This is really helpful. Well, thank you, Rob, for playing along. I really appreciate the feedback. It helps us to know that we're doing good work here and putting out good content for you guys because our mission is to help you grow. Whatever that means for you, our mission is to fix agencies. There are always broken things in agencies and our mission is to help you fix your agency so that you can turn it into the agency of your dreams and that they can support you and your lifestyle, whatever that looks like for you. If that's a team of three, if it's a team of 30, if it's a team of 300, whatever it looks like for you, uh, it's your goal, it's your life, it's your vision. We're just here to help you fix it and get it to where you want it to be. All right, this has been super fun. Uh, come and join me tomorrow. I think we're an hour later tomorrow, 9 a.m. Melbourne time, tomorrow morning in the Facebook group here where we will go through the entire Team Accelerator blueprint and I'll show you the mind map. Get ready to make lots of notes and I'm going to answer all of your questions and we will show you how you can get access to the Team Accelerator blueprint training so that you can work with us over the next, you know, four, five, six, seven weeks to get your first or next team member hired. All of those details coming up tomorrow on the Agency Hour. For those of you listening to the podcast, once again, please come and join the Digital Mavericks Facebook group and be a part of it. Until tomorrow, have a great day wherever you are and I'll see you then. Bye for now.